Okay, folks, uh, good afternoon. Um, I presume you can all hear me again. I'm back for more, and hopefully you're, you're not going to be a tough crowd this afternoon. And I suppose, for those of you not here earlier, uh, my name is John Gibney, and I'm one of the assistant editors with one of the research projects in the Academy called Documents in Irish Foreign Policy. And what I want to do is, I mentioned it earlier on in the course of uh, discussing the treaty exhibition, but I want to give you a sense here now of what it is and what the nuts and bolts are, what it actually does. And in a nutshell, what the, what this, the project is, and the project is kind of distinctive in that it's a partnership between the, Arch the Academy here, the National Archives of Ireland, which is where our office actually is, and to you know, retain the collections that we tend to, that we publish, and also uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs. And what we do is we publish archival material relating to Ireland's foreign relations since 1919. Now, coming through into this room, you will have gone through the library, the academy, you would have come across, uh, you would have, if you glanced at the bookshelves, you would have seen many printed calendars of documents, the primary source material. So it's a long and, um, I would like to think, a distinguished uh, pastime to make, you know, primary source material and manuscripts more immediately accessible to the public. Um, it's by no means unprecedented for a country to publish these kind of documents on its foreign relations. Lots of countries do it. The United States has been doing it since pretty much before the US Civil War. And um, we're the Irish equivalent of that. The project's been in running since 1998 or 1997. And every two years, we produce one of these. We basically turn a pile of material like, like that into one of these fine, handsome publications right here. And this is the most recent one, volume 12, which is going for the princely sum of 30 euros, a bargain outside. Um, and given that this is a publicly funded project, accountability is a good thing and productivity is a good thing. So every two years we produce one of these from our little IRE up in the National Archives. It's kind of funny because, you know, when people say work for the Royal Irish Academy, people start getting, they start going all, you know, mushy about how it must be wonderful to work in this fantastic Georgian building. Says, no, we don't work in this fantastic building. We work overlooking a warehouse, listening to lots of seagulls all day. But that's a practical necessity because we need to be close to the material that we publish. I would want to talk you through here is some of that material, why we publish it, what's in it, what are the criterion for selecting that stuff? And if you were to, um, now the material that we publish has all been released to, to the National Archives under the 30 year rule, whereby government departments are supposed to release their files and the Department of Foreign Affairs is quite assiduous about doing this. Um, and what we're looking at is, I suppose, we're looking for stuff that, I suppose the clue is in the term policy. If you were to look at, um, if we were to be called, you know, documents in Irish foreign relations, well, that's pretty much everything. You know, you know that, that covers so much, it would be unfeasible to do it. Policy gives it a different angle, and the guiding principle for choosing material is how it sheds light on how decisions were made, how Irish foreign policy evolved. And it's not absolute. I mean, we, we try to include material as well that like reflects an Irish perspective on, um, you, know, war, you know, events of global importance. But I suppose the thing is that it's not so much diplomatic history, which is very much out of fashion these days, so much as history viewed through the lens of diplomacy, which is quite a different thing. The Irish Foreign Service traditionally, and for, most, for much of its existence, was fairly small, um, reflecting a small and relatively impoverished state. So its diplomats had to cover a lot of angles, which means a lot of material pops up in those files that we go through. Um, you know, it's not just receipts for Ferrer Roche and whatever, you know. It covers a huge and diverse range of material. Now, the kind of stuff that we publish, we also, alongside the, um, the document volumes, we also publish kind of ancillary projects, side projects. The treaty was one of them, you know. Another one would be this equally fine publication. In fact, quite possibly one of the finest books ever written and produced and designed, which is going for the slightly less princely sum of 20 euros outside, but which is an illustrated history of Irish foreign policy, which we did as a centenary project a couple of years ago. So alongside the main business of the project, we do do kind of, you know, initiatives that are intended to kind of publicize what we do. At the moment, uh, we're working on an exhibition um, and a project to commemorate 50 years of Ireland's entry into the, um, into the EEC. But the bread and butter are these green lads here, okay? And we're about to publish the 13th edition in the series, which covers the years from 1965 to 1969. Now, we don't really get a, get a chance to publish um, photographic material in the volumes, you know? Like, we found this, I thought it was a pretty groovy image of Sean Lamas in Milan in 1959, which made its way into the illustrated history. Um, 
And, you know, the illustrated history was a good way of incorporating visual material, you know. That's another one, three diplomats, all women at the United Nations, and the alignment of the three countries in alphabetical order is kind of quite striking. The, it dates to 1956, and the Irish um, representative is Sheila Murphy, who was a very long-serving uh, Irish diplomat. And the Irish Diplomatic Service, just, you know, it was subject to the marriage bar that was in place until 1973, so the careers of female diplomats were often cut off um, you know, early because they married or were curtailed in advance in the expectation that they were going to get married and leave the service anyway, so why bother promoting them, you know? Now, one thing that makes our project distinctive is that, unlike many of our international peers, we're not part of a foreign ministry. So no one in the Department of Foreign Affairs gets to see that before it goes to print. And we have discretion, all the material is publicly available. But if you've gone to the National Archives to go through this stuff, you're talking about vast collections of material. And it's quite possible somebody could say, get in a train from Galway, come up to Dublin, go to the National Archives, put in their five or six slips for the day, which is the maximum order they can put in, or whatever the number is these days, and they're going to come back with a load of brochures from the 1950s or 60s, which are of no use to them. You know, material is sent back, but it takes a lot to navigate through it. So what we're trying to do is make it more accessible. And that brings me to the question of how we start and what we choose. I suppose um, what I want to do is kind of emphasise that and these are these are kind of facsim these are the kind of representatives of some of the documents you will find in there, okay? And these are facsimiles that are gonna go into the volume. You know, we do include some facsimiles just to give a sense of what's what. But we kind of start at the top because if you take the view that material is was filtering upwards to be discussed by the government. Um, to enable decisions to be made. What we do is kind of work our way back down the chain of command, so to speak. So the first things we look at are the minutes of governments. We go, the volumes tend to cover the terms of governments. We run from election to election because it's the best way of keeping it neutral. You know, different historic milestones have different resonances for different people. And I think the fairest and most neutral way of, I suppose, demarcating the terms of reference and the terms of the periods that we look at is to go from a one election to the next. So the ones at the moment are kind of, you know, the, the, this volume ends in April 1920 with one election. The current volume forthcoming begins in April 19, 1965 with that election and continues until the general election um, of July 1969, just before the outbreak of the Troubles in Earnest, which will be covered in the next volume. What we do is first thing we look at are the minutes of governments. Okay, that gives you a sense of what kind of things are being discussed at a cabinet table. What we then look at are the files of the Department of the Taoiseach. Um, you know, the files that would have been discussed, that would have informed those discussions, and then we work our way back down into the files of the Department of Foreign Affairs itself. So we kind of draw from the, the, the Department of the Taoiseach, the Department of Foreign Affairs, and also some private collections, like the, the, the collections of people like, say, Frank Aiken, for example, uh, being a key figure for, um, for the period we're still, we're still studying. But the bulk of it comes from the National Archives. After that, we would look at the papers of secretary generals, or secretaries as they were called then. So the head of the department, therefore the advisor to the incumbent minister for foreign affairs. Then we drop down to where you start getting into the real cream of the crop. The reports that were submitted to, um, to the Department of Foreign Affairs from Irish embassies by ambassadors. And we'll come to that in a moment. Then you go down into what are called the general registry files, and ultimately you're kind of going down, 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 until you get to the files of embassies themselves, which very often contain some of the most co literally colourful material, but not the most consequential for our point of view, and stuff like that rarely makes the cut. Now what we're looking for here, and just to kind of go through what these two things are, and they're short documents, I mean, like some of the stuff we publish is massive, and ultimately we're going through the stuff looking for a, a perspective on Irish affairs. And to give one example where the penny dropped for me working on this, in that volume, John F. Kennedy looms large, understandably. He also gets shot halfway through it, okay, and was succeeded by Lyndon Johnson. So we're looking at um, a document produced by the incumbent ambassador, Thomas Kiernan, in the aftermath of Kennedy's assassination. And he offers this kind of very, very informed, fantastic, fascinating kind of overview of the US political landscape in late 1963. And you're reading it there and there thinking, well, this is fascinating, it's great stuff. But where is the angle from an Irish perspective? Till you get to the last paragraph where his conclusion is, within this changing American political landscape, the door to the White House that was open under John F. Kennedy will be closed under Johnson. That while he will be friendly, he won't offer, uh, offer any favours. And then you think, right, that's a conclusion. And that enables you to include that particular thing. Um, other examples that come to, come to light from, the current, from the, the current volume we're doing, because what we do is we go through these files, okay? This one here on the, on, the, on the right has a couple of characteristics that mark it for inclusion. It's a letter from uh, Hugh McCann, who was the Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs, to the Secretary of the Government, a guy called Nicholas Nolan. It's about landing rights. 
now I can see all of you jumping up in excitement at the thought of landing rights in Shannon Airport or Dublin. But it's important economically and for tourism and for development in the 1960s. And it touches, it was a, very, it was a bit of a bone of contention with the US government. Now, one thing you like about it is that it's annotated. Handwriting at the bottom, Jack Lynch. You know, you can see at the top, seen with the Taoiseach with the tick. Another one over here, okay, a letter from um, Frank Aiken, then the Minister for, uh, for, for External Affairs, as it was called. It was only called Foreign Affairs from 1971 onwards. The External Affairs was kind of a hangover from our membership of the Commonwealth earlier in the century. And that's writing to, um, to Jack Lynch as Taoiseach about the Biafran War, the Nigerian Biafran Civil War, which looms large in the current volume, you know, given the fact that in Nigeria at that time, and in the separatist province of Biafra, there was a very substantial number of Irish missionaries who famously got involved in relief efforts, some which the Irish government kind of viewed with, a, you know, wariness. There was there was suspicions that um, the Irish government didn't want to recognise the province, the Nigerian province of Biafra, not least because it kind of undermined an argument against partition in Ireland, you know. But that you know issue of the Biafran War, which marks, I suppose, an engagement with African countries as well is a big theme in the volume we're working on. But both of those will go in as facsimiles to give you a sense of what some of these things actually look like. Um, in going through those files, we tend to, stuff tends to fall out. I mean, when we were working on this book here, we were going through files for the, uh, the Irish Embassy in Nigeria, and that popped out of a folder. We thought we need a, a picture to illustrate an Irish diplomat in Africa, and thought this is a perfect candidate. Um, and very often these images can be pristine. This one came out of a file in the, from the Embassy in Washington DC, still wrapped in paper, in this filigree paper, and almost certainly you could probably say this had never been opened since somebody sent it in uh, the 1960s. Now that's the Irish ambassador William P. Fay, Lyndon Johnson, and the infamous bowl of shamrock. Now the actual report for that event, that now it's all smiling, Fay was told going in, listen, there's no time for small talk here, Johnson's busy. You know, you're getting a photo up, it'll look nice, but that's about, that's, that's all you're getting this time around, you know. And it's funny how the, the, the focus on that ceremony, a few years later when he was doing it with Nixon, he would write back to Dublin in 1969 that, you know, President Nixon was much, much warmer than his predecessor. And his theory was that Nixon was warmer than his predecessor because he had one eye on Edward Kennedy as a possible future presidential candidate in 1972 and therefore wanted to make sure that whatever was left of an Irish vote was kept on side. Though this was obviously before an event like Chappaquiddick derailed those, um, the trajectory that many assumed Ted Kennedy would be on at that stage. So stuff like this pops up. And if we can use it, we will. But the meat and drink is this kind of stuff here, okay? This is another document that's going to be in the volume. Did you know that there was a message from Eamon de Valera on the moon? Well, you do now, because there is, okay? In Irish, no less, okay? May God grant that skill and courage which... What's it saying? May God grant that the skill and courage which enable man to reach the moon may assist in the establishment of a peaceful and happier world. Now, that was recommended by Frank Aiken as Tarnishta. And Frank Aiken was... Um, you know, very concerned with international affairs, in particular with, particularly with the prospect of nuclear war. You know, um, the first nuclear non-proliferation treaty, you know, signed from 1968 onwards, was very much done at Aiken's instigation. Um, and in fact, he was the, the first person to sign it, which was kind of a seen as a kind of a token of appreciation for his efforts, even though Ireland didn't have nuclear weapons and I presume doesn't have any now. Um, so in a way, that little message is going to reflect some of Aiken's preoccupations, but it was put on a microfilm that was sent up to the moon on the Apollo 11 mission and there it rests. So, you know, you could say that there is going to, you know, an Irish diplomatic engagement with the rest of the universe, but we'll see how that's going to work out in time to come. But you can't not include something like that, you know, the Apollo mission. Like, you know, it's, stuff like that is interesting. So you want to throw in stuff that reflects human issues, you know, the, the reality of some kind of thing, of, of events, like... Um, you know, we've documents that kind of documents that reflect how the department actually worked internally, as well as what its representative saw. Um, that's Aiken signing the um, the treaty itself in Moscow in 1968. Another one here, small a small document that tells you a lot. Telegrams. We don't use them anymore. They're kind of artifacts. What it is, however, telling you, it touches on another key theme in the volume, which is Ireland's membership at EEC, because probably the single world leader who was mo of mo with whom Irish diplomats were most preoccupied in the 1960s, wasn't a US president or necessarily a British prime minister, but a French president in the former Charles de Gaulle. Because he, de Gaulle's insistence on keeping Britain out of the EEC was of great importance to a country like Ireland that adamantly wanted to get into the EEC. So you do have quite a lot of um, you know, reports of you know, conversations with de Gaulle trying to persuade him that, you know, we're not the same as the British, you know, well, come on, give us, cut us a break, let us in, you know. And naturally, so naturally, his resignation and the removal of what was seen as a stumbling block was of great importance. And that's reflected in Little Martinalia at the bottom, where somebody has written, bless my European soul, 
at the bottom of that telegram, which would have been circulated around the Department of External Affairs. Now, what we do is we transfer them into these things here, okay? Um, that's, a, that's basically, a page, they're two pages from the forthcoming volume. So we go through these files, and what we do is we, and we look through quite possibly tens of thousands of documents. Eventually, we'll, get a, we'll create a database, you know, a spreadsheet where we put all this material on file and indicate what it's about, its metadata, its references, who was sent it, who got it, where was it sent from, where was it sent to. And when we get to about 2,000, we begin to cut it down and cut it down and cut it down. There's three people working on the project full time. Um, there's also an, ed an academic advisory board. So we have a couple of meetings then. We have a two-year production schedule. First year is research, second year is production and editing. And we cut down those documents quite drastically to a manageable number. Now, some of those, now, it, it is the case that, you know, when we go to, you know, really edit the material, because we make a selection of documents, they then get typed up. We then begin to read them out to each other to make sh against the original documents to make sure that everything is precise and is exact because you only really get one shot at this. Um, and the process, we cut down stuff even further. You know, you'll often see a thing in the documents, matter omitted. But this is not hiding some kind of state secrets. It just means that kind of boring, tedious stuff or extraneous material has been removed and you might get to the meat of a document. Like, take, give you one example. There's a document about arranging ministerial meetings to European capitals, you know. A lot of it is a bit boring. It's kind of like, have you written to so-and-so? Why not? When are you going to write to him? Blah, 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 blah. But then the sections of it that are quite different that indicate why this might be important. That perhaps at the end of the 60s, it might be a good idea to arrange these visits to European capitals to keep the prospect of Ireland's membership at EEC on the collective, on collective European radars. You know, that apart from the minutiae of actually organising these visits, they were being done with a very deliberate purpose. And you would put that in because it shows a certain particular approach. Um, we also begin to kind of cut it down as much as possible because it has to fit within two covers. You know, and even that's, I mean, that's, you could handily assault someone with this if you wanted, okay? Um, but it's, you know, you can only publish X, X amount. So we, we, we try to be ruthless. Like, um, and we annotate it as well. Like, you're trying to reconstruct the world in which these people live. So biographies, references to other international events or issues. I mean, uh, I think if you look in the footnotes, you'll come across the Roadrunner. And, um, you know, my own, my own, one of my own favourite footnotes was digging into... Uh, the permanent representative of the Vatican to the United Nations, who uh, later drew on his experience to write a novel and called, uh, called Requiem for a Spy, in which the permanent representative of the Vatican to, um, to the United Nations is kidnapped by the KGB and replaced by a Soviet agent, you know, who then falls in love with an Israeli secret agent at the UN and a romance and so and so. It's not the kind of thing you'd expect from a senior Catholic cleric, you know, but it's worth pointing out that this drew on his experiences, which are germane to the subject of the volume. And we're also trying to cut stuff down further and further and further. One theme that pops up in the current volume is the outbreak of the Troubles. So one, and which registered quite widely in Irish America. Irish constants were recording, you know, protest outside. Despite the fact that we're covering the 60s, we only have one reference to a beatnik. No hippies, but one beatnik who was protesting outside an Irish consulate to demand justice for Joe Donnelly, who had been interned. There were three documents indicating protests outside the U US consulates. So which one do you pick? We said, let's kick that to touch and figure it out and see how the themes fit into the volume. We have to take one, but we won't know which one as the process begins. It's like, there is a certain creativity in trying to figure out what to include because you're trying to be as representative as possible. Um, other examples from the United States, we put in... Um, you know, William Fay tended to write long memos as ambassador. That's grand. Um, but there were two examples where we had to choose one, one rather than two. We want to include a perspective on world events. So you do get things like, say, the Six Day War, the Prague Spring, um, you know, upheaval in France in May 1968 reflected in the contents of the volume. And you will also get, say, um, the assassination of, of Bobby Kennedy and the Vietnam War. And there's a, I mean, there's a fascinating document that made the cut about the impact of Bobby Kennedy's assassination. There's an equally fascinating document about going to the funeral. But we thought, oh, that's, that's just really a descriptive narrative. It doesn't really add much. He went to the funeral. It was a funeral, you know, and they say, I don't say that in a flippant way, you know. But for our purposes, that was the one that went. Did you include, if you have two reports by an ambassador that touch on the Vietnam War, because you can't not include the Vietnam War for the 60s. Do you choose the one that um, illustrates the impact and shock of the Tet Offensive of 1968 upon the United States, or do you include the generic one about the status quo in the Vietnam War at any one time? The latter fell by the wayside. The first one that illustrated the seismic shock went in. So you're trying to provide that perspective 
on global events as much as possible, all the while keeping the selection as tight as possible, annotating it to make it explicable to people and to reconstruct the world in which these diplomats operated. Because, you know, while some would argue you should only include Irish material, that's not good enough because these, the whole point of having a Department of Foreign Affairs or External Affairs was to operate in a world where there was more than just Ireland. So you have to reflect that and think of this material as a window into the world. And I always think of it as, um, you know, it's not diplomatic history so much as Irish history through the lens of diplomacy. Now, the decade of centenaries has thrown up a particular interest in primary source material, okay? With the military archives in particular doing incredible work in making uh, the raw material from which history is constructed available to the wider public. But there's nobody publishing archival material for Irish history for the second half of the 20th century except us. We're currently up to um, the period 1965 to 1969. Um, that volume will be emerging in November. We are literally at the stage of signing off on the proofs and checking the index. And we're already beginning the next one, volume 14, which will cover uh, the Fianna Fáil government that was in power from July 1969 until March 1973, which uncovers some of the most brutal and significant years of the Troubles. And as time goes on, the sheer volume of material that we're going to have to go through will increase. As Ireland joined the EEC, as the Troubles became a, 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 pix, a fixture on the, Irish, um, on the Irish landscape, so to speak, as more, as simply as more embassies were produced to produce more paperwork. But the core purpose of the project is fairly simple. Our job is to take this material, make it ex as accessible as is possible in the form of those green volumes. They will go online on an open access basis eventually, so I would encourage you to explore it as best you can. Um, and I suppose all I can say after that is, having given you some taste of what we do, what we're trying to do is make this stuff easier to access. People are interested in it. All you have to do is go into an archive, go into the library here, pick it up off a shelf, have a flick through it, see what's there, because you will be surprised at what's in there. And um, if you get any book tokens for Christmas, we'll have a new volume on the shelves. And it will make, a, combined with a box of Ferrero Rocher, it is the perfect gift for the diplomat in your life. So I would encourage you to think along those lines. Um, on that note, I'll make way for the next speaker. And thank you for listening.